Good morning, Tate's Creek Christian Church. We're glad that you're gathered here into this worship gathering where we proclaim every week the central truth of the gospel that Jesus came from heaven, dwelled among us, lived a perfect life, and showed us how to worship the Father, even to the point of giving his own life on the cross. He died for us. He was buried, and he was raised on the third day by the Father, and now is ascended and seated next to the Father, interceding for us. So even as we gather here and pray uh, for prayer this morning and hear his word, he is among us by the power of his Holy Spirit and interceding on our behalf. Not only this, do we serve a God who is risen and reigning, but a God who is coming again to bring us to himself, that we might dwell with him eternally. That is the good news that we celebrate each and every week here in this space. And uh, so if you're a guest with us, and you haven't heard that before, uh, we welcome you into that story as we've been welcomed into God's story as well. If you're a guest with us this morning and it's your first time with us, we ask that you fill out a Connect, connect card that's right in front of you in the pew, uh, the pew back. Uh, so you can pull that out, fill that out, and put it in the offering as it's passed later in our service or put it in our giving boxes at the end or even take it out to our Connection Center and meet with, uh, with Ernie or any of our staff or volunteers. They'd love to get connected with you, love to know more about you and your family, and ways that you can get connected here at Tate's Creek through uh, service opportunities. This is our serve month, so we're emphasizing that uh, through service opportunities and through a Sunday school class. Why don't we all stand as we uh, celebrate the joy of our salvation by the singing of this psalm setting. Joyful, joyful. Let's sing together with voices aloud. Joyful. Christ is made the sure foundation, Christ the head and cornerstone, chosen of the Lord and precious, binding all the church in one, holy Zion's help forever, and her confidence of
left in awe of the fact, how great thou art. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether in earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Not only this, does he die on our cross, our cross of sin and condemnation and guilt and shame, but he also is resurrected for us. And so this tune that we sang earlier, Joyful, Joyful, now becomes around this table our song of remembrance of the joy of our salvation brought to us by the resurrection of our Savior. We sing this hymn together. Alleluia, alleluia, hearts to heaven and voices raised. Sing to God a hymn of gladness. Sing to God a hymn of praise. He who on the cross as Savior for the world's salvation Jesus Christ, the King of glory, now is risen from the dead. Now the iron bars are broken, Christ from death to life is born. Glorious life and life immortal. We can't drive very far without seeing road signs that kind of give us an alert of things to come, yield or uh, stop sign ahead. And although as we drive, we sometimes will come to a four-way stop and it causes us to pause and look in multiple directions. And as I was going and doing that this week, it kind of made me think about this time as we come. It's kind of like a four-way stop. We're directed to look in multiple directions. And the Bible offers us something very similar in that fact during this time. We are directed to look inward. In 1 Corinthians, it says, Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. You see, looking inward at our spiritualness opens our eyes to see the need for His grace. And then we're instructed to look outward. Uh, the very next verse in First Corinthians says, I tell you, I will not drink from the fruit of this vine. Sorry, for those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. So we're pointed to see the body of Christ and remember the needs and transgressions of those around us. We should be aware of our brothers and sisters in need during this time as well. And then we're told to look forward to Christ's return. In Matthew, it says, I, will, I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine for now on until the day that I drink anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Sharing the Lord's Supper, sharing this time of communion, communing with others who believe and have the same faith and the same direction allows us to join together in the wedding feast of the Lamb. And perhaps most importantly, we are told to look backwards. In Luke it says, And he took of the bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. The emblems of Christ's body and blood are visual reminders for us of his sacrifice on our behalf. So just as a four-way stop tells us to pause and look in multiple directions, I want to encourage you as, as we come into this time of communion to pause, to look in the multiple directions, look inward, look outward, look to the future, 
and look back. Our Father God in heaven, we come before you this morning to give you praise, glory, and honor for the Son you sent to an earth that needed him. We live in a world that simply has no peace, at least not the peace that we experience, knowing that as a result of his death, burial, and resurrection, we know that we have an assurance of eternal life with you. That's a peace that allows us to confront the challenges of this world, and even confront death, knowing there's something more for us. But what you've called us to do is to share that peace with others, and that's our obligation that we have taken. Help us to live up to that expectation, dear Father. Be with us now as we partake of this communion to remember his death and burial and resurrection. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. While Christ was in the upper room, he took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and he offered it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body. After they eaten, he took up the cup, he blessed it and offered it to his disciples saying, take, drink from it, all of you, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Normally, at this time in our service, we highlight one of our opportunities to give, and we often talk about our financial gifts to the Lord, but this week, uh, we really want to focus on how we can give in other ways, and this month is Serve Month. We've been talking about this for weeks now, about how each one of us in this room can look for opportunities outside the walls of Tate's Creek Christian Church to be the hands and feet of Jesus, and so we wanted to share with you guys just a couple of ways that some people in the church have already started doing that, and so, for example, our hands and feet ministry, they got outside the walls of this church and served at Lifeline Christian Mission, and uh, they were packing meals, and uh, they're going to be shipped around the world uh, to care for people who are in in really great need. And so this is pretty cool. One, they got really great hairnets. Uh, So if you're looking for a place to serve, this one has great accessories. Uh, So I highly recommend, if you've never served with Lifeline, to give them a call. They're a great organization to check out. 
also, one of our men's group, there's a group of guys called this Barnabas group, and they help different individuals in our church when there's something that comes up, and uh, they jump in and help a bunch of ways. They were able to help one of our church members who had some yard work that really needed some help. And so you could see kind of before and after, but these guys got after it, and they were literally Jesus' hands and got some thorns, I'm sure, stuck in them along the way. Uh, but this is just one of the ways that we can love and serve outside the walls of this church. Certainly there's lots of opportunities inside. We need ushers and greeters and people to work in the children's ministry and youth ministry and tech team and worship team and choir. But there's all these opportunities outside the walls of our church where we can give and serve the Lord in a way that brings light into really dark places. And so we just want to take a moment to pray uh, for, for these opportunities and the ones that are going to come the rest of this month and opportunities for you that might show up right at your doorstep. You might not even see coming, and there the Lord presents you with this great opportunity to serve. So let's pray. Lord, Lord, we give an offering to you, but, but Lord, our offerings are not limited to, to dollars. Lord, you've called us to offer our lives to you. That means our time and our talents and our resources. And so, Lord, this month especially, it's always true, but this month we're asking, would you open our eyes to see places that we can practically serve you. Maybe it's an after school program that needs some people to help tutor kids. Maybe it's a neighbor whose home needs a repair and they can't call a repairman, but there you are. Lord, maybe it's a single mom who needs somebody to watch her kids for a few hours so she can go to the grocery store in quiet. Maybe it's a friend who needs a phone call or a visit in the hospital. Lord, in a very real sense, you use your people to show your love to the world. And we want to do that. We want to do it well. And so, Lord, we pray that you would bless these offerings. And Lord, that it would be a light in a dark place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. From the, whoa, sorry, from the earliest centuries of the church, worship has really been quite simple and endured uh, through a, a similar pattern where we have word and table, the hearing of God's word and the response uh, of God's people at his table. And uh, in the earliest, from the earliest centuries, there was this prayer called a prayer of illumination. And it was basically just a prayer before the sermon where we would pray to have God illumine our hearts with his word. And so today, uh, we're not going to pray necessarily by bowing our heads or closing our eyes, but by standing and singing uh, this prayer to God, confirming that his word is our firm foundation. Even dating back to Jesus' day, people were asking, what is truth? And so I invite you today to stand as we proclaim that the truth is Jesus himself, his word. This morning, um, I'm going to give you guys a heads up. Our text this morning is a little weird, okay? And sometimes when you're walking through a book of the Bible verse by verse, you're going to come across the passage and you go, 
That's weird. And, and today is definitely one of those days. And so to, to help us understand, I thought I'd do something a little bit weird. And so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to play a sound, and I just want you to sit there and I want you to let your mind wander to wherever it goes. When you hear this noise, I just want whatever comes in, just let that thought come in. Visualize whatever it is. But here is the sound um, that we're going to check out. So listen to this. Let's, uh, let's just take a second, let our minds soak this in. That's a good sound. Some of you know that sound really well. I can see the joy on your faces. Other ones are going, I have no idea what that is. And so, you know what, why don't we, why don't we just listen to that again? That's a great sound. Let's listen to that again one more time. All right, I'm not going to put that on the communion table. That just feels weird. But we're going to set it right here for now. <laughs> when I hear that sound, man, where does your mind go? I'll tell you where mine goes. I'm not a big dessert fan, but for me, a classic piece of cheesecake with those strawberries and that little drizzle, and then you top it off with some whipped cream, and I'm in heaven. I mean, I, my face lights up. I'm excited. I'm not a big dessert guy, but boy, you take me to Cheesecake Factory. We are going to have a good day. I mean, that's where my mind goes. Uh, for you, it might be something different. Maybe you hear that sound and your mind goes straight to ice cream. You go, oh, favorite ice cream, chocolate drizzle, some sprinkles on top. And then you just finish that sucker off with a little bit of whipped cream and you go, we are in heaven. We are talking. Some of you guys, you go, food, I thought of a drink. I thought of a nice hot caramel macchiato or a, a cookies and cream milkshake or for my wife, a little hot chocolate, you know, in the wintertime on a day like today. It sort of feels like you can put a whipped cream on just about anything. It's going to make it better, you know? I mean, whipped cream is just delicious. But, you know, the more you think about it, you can't put whipped cream on anything and make it better. Steak and whipped cream, <laughs> not better. Salmon and whipped cream, not better. Fried chicken and whipped cream, not better. There's some things you just can't put it on that's going to make it better. Like, for example, it doesn't matter how much whipped cream you have. If you take all the whipped cream in the world and you put it on top of manure, not better. <laughs> I don't care how much whipped cream you have. I'm not going to eat that, okay? There's no way in the world. But, you know, the opposite's actually really true. You put a little manure on just about anything, it's gross, okay? It doesn't matter. You put a little manure on cheesecake, I'm not eating it. You put a little manure on ice cream, Throw it away. It doesn't matter what you have. You add a little manure to it, and that's just disgusting. Nobody wants to touch it. It's just, it's just gross. And that's exactly the point that Haggai is trying to make to the people of Israel. So if you have a Bible, and I hope you do, turn with me to the book of Haggai. It's sort of towards the end of the Old Testament. So if you can find the book of Matthew, just go back about 12 pages, and you should be in the book of Haggai, which is where we're going to be this morning. Now, so far in our story, Israel's moved back to their homeland. They've been in, in exile for 48 years. It's been a not good go for them. And then when they return, instead of rebuilding the temple, they just sort of move on with their lives. And so God sends this prophet, a guy named Haggai, to call them out. And so the prophet, he has this first conversation with them. And the people repent, and immediately they go back to work. And they start rebuilding the temple. And you go, okay, man, this story is off to a great start. But just as they're getting started, over the next month, there's all these religious holidays. And those were good things that they slowed all the work down. They reminded the people of some really important things. And then Haggai comes in and he has the second conversation. And he reminds them of sin again. But this time he offers them a little bit of encouragement. He reminds them, hey, God is with you. Even though you might be walking through some really serious disappointment in your life, God is in your midst. And now, after about another two months have passed, lots of work has been taking place. The temple's really coming along. Good things are happening. God sends his prophet Haggai to have a third conversation. Let's pick up where we left off. Haggai chapter 2, verse 10. 
It says, on the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet. Now, now so far in our book, dates have been pretty important. And so we want to kind of zoom in and go, okay, what's up with this date? It's the 24th day of the ninth month. For us, that would be December 18th about. Now, in Israel, in mid-October was their rainy season. So right now, this is where their rain would start showing up. And it would soften the ground, and that would kind of allow you to start planting. And so this was kind of the time where they're getting ready. They're planting their, their seeds, their crops. They're getting ready for a new year. It's a really important time. And so all that takes place in October, November. But by mid-December, all the planting should be done. There's nothing left to do. The only thing you do at that point in Israel is you just pray and wait. You pray that there's not a drought. You pray that there aren't any pests that destroy the crops. You pray that they yield as much as you expect. You, you pray for a really good harvest. And so you just sort of, you sort of sit and you sort of wait. And God saw that as a perfect opportunity to have a conversation. You got nothing better to do. And so in verse 11, it says, Thus says the Lord of hosts. He said, ask the priest about the law. If someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment... And touches with his fold bread or stew or wine or oil or any kind of food. Does it become holy? And the priest answered and said, no. And then Agai said, if someone who's unclean by, by contact of a, a dead body touches any of these, does it become unclean? And the priest answered and said, it does become unclean. See, in the Old Testament, priests would make these sacrifices for the people. And they would go in, they would make a sacrifice. And in that process, let's say that they were cutting up an animal and making the sacrifice, and some of that animal maybe fell off the table and it got caught in like the fold of their, of their cloak. Or, or maybe they were moving some of that meat and they left some in a pocket, for example. And so the question is, this meat has been sacrificed to the Lord. It's holy now. And so does whatever it touched become holy? Like, it, is your garment holy? And if you brush up something, does this become holy? Does this become holy? Does everything you touch become holy? And the priests go, no, that's, that's not how it works. That's, that's, that's not how holiness works. It doesn't work like that. He said, but on the flip side... If you touch a dead body, it, it, for Israel in the Old Testament, if you touch a dead body, it made you ceremonially unclean. And, and that was a process that they had to go to be made clean again in order for them to worship right. And so it would make you unclean. And then anything that you touched, it became unclean. So if I touched a dead body and then I touched you, you're unclean now. And you're like, well, that's not fair. Hey, that's just how it works, okay? So if you touch something unclean, it would make you unclean. So it's sort of like whipped cream and manure. Whipped cream doesn't make everything better, but manure makes everything worse, okay? It makes everything dirty. So verse 14, then Haggai answered and said, So it is with this people and with this nation before me, declares the Lord. And so with every work of their hands and what they offer there is unclean. What, what is Haggai getting at? What's the Lord trying to tell his people? He's trying to say this, holiness doesn't rub off. It doesn't. Holiness doesn't, doesn't rub off. Just because the people were building a holy place doesn't mean it would magically make them holy people. The temple wasn't going to rub off on them. The, the same thing is true today. So you can go to church, but just because you show up, it doesn't make you holy. I wish it did. That would be an awesome deal. But that's not how it works. It doesn't make you holy. You can be around really godly people. But their faith doesn't transfer to you. And so you might have the, the, like the most holy, godliest grandmother in the world. But just because you're a grandson or your granddaughter doesn't make you holy. Doesn't, doesn't transfer to you. Your parents or your spouse might be unbelievable Christians. But it doesn't make you holy. Holiness doesn't rub off. But sin, sin taints everything. It, it's like a disease. It, it destroys everything it touches. So you take a friendship, a really good friendship, but somebody you've been friends with for years, and you sprinkle in a little gossip. Just watch what happens. Destroys a year-long friendship. You take two business partner, partners, and you just add in just a few little lies. And one lie becomes another lie, becomes another lie, becomes another lie, and it poisons the business. You take a marriage, and you add just a little bit of lust. You take two neighbors and you add just a little bit of envy. Take a team and add some pride or, or arrogance. Take, take a church and just pour in some jealousy. Sin taints everything. 
and it will destroy everything it touches. It destroys our body, it destroys our culture, it destroys our relationships, it even destroys our own hearts. The scripture talks about this all the time. He warns Timothy, he says, Timothy, it's going to get worse. He says this in, uh, in the book of 2 Timothy, he says, but know this, difficult times will come in the last days. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, without love for what's good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. You go, man, that's, that's rough. That sounds, that sounds awful. And then Paul adds one last thing. He writes this, that in the last days, people will be holding to the form of godliness, but denying its power. All these things that Paul listed out aren't descriptions of the world. They're descriptions of people who call themselves Christians. People who take on this appearance, this form of godliness, but they don't really have it. People who've claimed to follow God, but don't really follow him. Jesus saw it in his day with religious leaders. He looked at the Pharisees and he called them hypocrites. He said, you're like whitewashed tombs, which appear beautiful on the outside, but on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones and every impurity. In the final book of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, there's seven letters written to seven different churches. One of the churches is this church called Sardis. And Jesus says to that church, he goes, I know your works. You have a reputation for being alive, but you're dead. Jesus says to these leaders, you look good on the outside, but on the inside you're dead. Revelation looks at this church and says, you have a great reputation, but you're dead. You might look good, but it doesn't mean that you're good. And so Israel's building this temple, and you go, man, that looks awesome. That looks incredible. That looks amazing. But it doesn't make them holy. It made them obedient. It didn't make them holy. See, apparently at the time, people were believing that, hey, we're rebuilding the temple. And because we're rebuilding the temple, we're awesome. We're fantastic. This is, this is it. Because we do this thing for God, now we are in. They fell into this trap of believing that somehow this act of building the temple, would, its holiness would rub off onto them. That it would make them holy people. Well, that's just whipped cream manure. It looks good, but it's not good. See, your relationship with God is not built on if your parents or your spouse are Christians. It's not built on if you went to church every year at Christmas and Easter. It's not built on if you tithe or if you serve. You're not saved by being a really good person. You're not even saved by being better than most people. Your proximity to holiness doesn't make you holy. The same way that going to a basketball and sitting courtside doesn't make you a better basketball player. Makes for an exciting game, but it doesn't make you better. It's the same way as like sleeping in your garage. That's not going to make you a car, okay? It's a rough sleep, but it's not going to turn you into a car. Your proximity to holiness doesn't make you holy. It doesn't rub off. And it's a lie to believe that we're saved by obeying and blessed by faith. That's not how the gospel works. No, instead, God says we're saved by faith and then blessed by obedience. The book of Ephesians, Paul gives this incredible picture. He says that before Christ, if you could see yourself, you, you were dead. You're this walking corpse. We lived according to our own passions, our own desires, our own purposes, our own desires. And he writes... But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses. That means even while you were still sinning, even before you were doing anything good at all, you had nothing to offer, nothing to bring to the table, no holiness of your own. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. And just a few verses later, in verse 8, he says, For by grace you've been saved through faith. This isn't your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works. So nobody can boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We aren't saved by works. We aren't saved by trying hard. We aren't saved by being good people. 
We're saved by faith. Not, not in what we do, but when, when Jesus has already done. I mean, Jesus has done a work. Jesus is the one whose work we put our trust in. Our faith is in his work on the cross. And so everything that we try and do to earn our way to heaven, it doesn't get us anywhere. So we put our trust in his work. Now that's not to say that being obedient doesn't bring blessings. Being obedient brings awesome blessings to your life. When, when you're obedient, when you do the things that God's called you to do, your life goes incredibly awesome places. It doesn't mean it's going to be perfect. doesn't mean it's going to be flawless. doesn't mean that trouble won't come. But obedience brings tons of blessing to your life. But it doesn't save you. We're saved by faith. We're blessed by obedience. God had chosen Israel to be his people. They were set apart, not because they were building a temple, but because they were God's. Not because they were better than other nations. Israel's a mess. But they were his people. God's what made them holy. And so Haggai's just making sure that they don't confuse the holy work with the holy one. Now, for us, we don't have a temple to build, so we really don't run this risk of confusing holy work from the holy one. But I think there's still a risk. There's still a question we have to ask ourselves. There's still something here that I think we should be pondering. Is it possible for us to follow Christianity and not follow Christ? Is that possible? Is it possible to do all the things that make you a Christian, at least from the world's perspective, to kind of wear it like a cloak that you wear around, but to not actually follow Jesus? You know, what would that even look like? It, it would look like whitewashed tombs. People who love to go to church but fail to love the body. People who study the Bible but don't actually follow Jesus' words. People who love to sing praises on Sunday morning but are cursing out their neighbor on Monday. People who are proud of their Christian reputation but are actually dead inside. And God gives Israel this warning, but he also gives them another challenge, something else to consider. Look at verse 15. He says, now then, consider from this day onward, before stone was placed upon stone in the temple of the Lord, how did you fare? When one came to a heap of 20 measures, there were but 10. When one came to a wine vat to draw 50 measures, there were but 20. I struck you and all the products of your toil and blight and with mildew and with hail, yet you didn't turn to me, declares the Lord. On the day that they started to rebuild the temple, they started to do what God had called them to do. Before a single stone was placed, God had placed a signpost. It's pointing two different directions. One way looks at the past, one way looks at the future. He goes, hey, I want you to consider your actions. I want you to slow down. I want you to stop. I want you to think about everything that's happened before this moment. And so he uses this illustration. He goes, hey, you, you had 20, but you only got 10. He describes this wine vat. He says, okay, you're going to take a, a bunch of grapes, and you expect that this amount of grapes is going to yield this much wine. And so you press the grapes, but you only get half as much as what you thought you were going to get. He says, that's your whole life. You expected this, reality was this. Because you weren't following me. You weren't trusting me. You were trusting yourself. You were going your own way. You are choosing your own path. And so he puts the signpost up and goes, I want you to really think about that life. I want you to think about your past. I want you to consider where it got you. What it added up to. For Israel, it meant their city was destroyed. Their temple was in ruins. And their people were in exile for nearly 50 years. And the Bible's full of these signpost stories. These moments where people's lives are defined by everything that happened before and everything that happens after. One of my favorites is in Luke chapter 7. Jesus is eating a meal with a Pharisee, one of these guys who's one of those whitewashed tombs. They're having these conversations. And, and back then they would have... They would have meals in like little courtyards. They were kind of open to the public. Like it was your place, but people could kind of walk in. And this woman walks in to interrupt their meal. She doesn't say anything. She just falls at Jesus' feet and she takes this bottle of perfume. She opens it up and she pours it on Jesus' feet. She, she's washing his feet. And she doesn't have anything to dry it with. And so she just takes her hair. And she starts to dry his feet. And you have to sort of read in between the lines a little bit. 
We don't really know much about this woman. What we know is that the religious leader says, she's a sinner. The kind of person you don't even want washing your feet. I mean, there's nothing glorious about washing somebody's feet. It, it's, it's a lowly job because, hey, you don't even want her to do that. We'll get somebody else. But Jesus knew exactly what kind of person she was. He knew her past. He knew everything she'd ever done. Every mistake, every regret, every single sin. But this is a signpost moment. It was a moment her life was going to be defined by everything before this, everything after this. Playwright Oscar Wilde once wrote, no man is rich enough to buy back his past. And I think if she could, she would have bought back her past. If she had the power to pay for everything that she's done, I think in this moment she would have. But the cost of her sin was more than she could afford. It's more than you can afford. But it's those who are deeply aware of their sin that are most affected by his grace. And so she does the only thing she knows how to do. She gets on her knees and pours out this expensive oil. This morning really is the same thing for you. It's a signpost moment. It's a moment for you to look at your past and go, where has sin taken you? What's it gotten you? Where has it led you? I mean, sin can be a lot of fun in the moment, but what has it destroyed? What has it cost you? You might look great on the outside. You might have an awesome reputation. People might even look at you in this room and go, oh man, that is the model of a Christian. But you know that what they see and what you see aren't always the same thing. This is a signpost moment for us to look inside and go, am I just a whitewashed tomb? Pretty on the outside, but dead on the inside. Look at verse 18. It says, consider from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, since the day the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider, is the seed yet in the barn? Indeed, the vine, the fig, the pomegranate, the olive tree have yielded nothing. But from this day on, I will bless you. And so it's not just a signpost looking back. It's a signpost looking forward. The day was the 24th day of the ninth month. It was December 18th. The crops had already been planted. Was there a harvest? No. Was there something little sprouting up? No, there was, there was nothing. But God said, just like that, a harvest is coming. The day that you decided to trust me, to follow me, the day that you decided to repent and turn was the day that I made my promise that I would bless you. See, the Pharisee saw nothing but a woman marked by sin. But Jesus saw a harvest. And so while she's still washing his feet, she's, she's bowing down and tears are streaming from her eyes. Jesus looks at the Pharisee and says, Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. She wasn't forgiven because she did a good work. She wasn't forgiving because she, she had cleaned his feet. She was forgiven because she put her hope and her trust in Jesus. Holiness doesn't rub off. Holiness is painted on with the blood of Christ. No man is rich enough to buy back his own past, but Jesus didn't have a past to buy back. He didn't have any sin. He didn't have any regrets. He didn't have any mistakes. He never fell short. And so instead of having to buy back his own life, he chose to buy back yours. And the cross became the ultimate signpost where we can look back at sin and disease and destruction and we can look forward to a hope and a future and a blessing. God's looking at his people saying, look, you know where sin's got you. Just think about it. You know what it's cost you. You know what it's destroyed. You know where you'll end up. But there's another path. There's, there's another way. And there's a harvest that's coming. And so God says, from this day on, you follow me. I will bless you. Now, in our culture, bless is sort of like a cute word. You know, uh, we say, you sneeze, I say, that's what we say, right? Um, we're from the South, 
So if we see people that we, we love or people that annoy us, we say, ah, oh, bless your heart, right? Uh, when you see a little kid, you go, oh, they're such a little blessing. For us, bless is a really cute word. It's not cute in Hebrew. In Hebrew, it, it has an entirely different connotation. It means to bestow a power upon someone. And so when God blesses his people, it's not a small thing, it's not a little thing, it's not a cute thing, it's a powerful thing. It's the power to transform us into new creations. It's the power to make us sons and daughters. It's the power to break addictions and restore marriages and heal hurt. It's the power to heal our prayers, the power to bring peace, the power to overcome sin and to overcome death, to overcome regret and disappointment. When God blesses his people, it is no small thing. And so today is October 8th, 2023. It is a signpost day. A day to look at the past, a day to look at the future. A day for each one of us in this room to consider, which path am I going to follow? What am I going to let be Lord of my life? Will it be sin? Will it be myself? Will it be my own desires? Will it be the world? Will it be the culture? Will it be my parents? Will it be my friends? Or will it be Christ? Am I really expecting that when I get to heaven, that I'm just hoping that somehow, somewhere along my path, that holiness sort of rubbed off on me? Or am I putting my hope in the truth that holiness has been painted over me with the blood of Jesus? And for the Christians in the room, we have to ask ourselves that question. Am I following Christianity or am I following Christ? Maybe today you've never put your trust in him. Maybe you know I've been walking down this road for a long time and God looks at you and goes, today is a day where you can choose to follow another path. And so during this next song, if you go, you know what, I, I want to know more about that. I want to figure this out. I'd love to talk to you about what it means to follow him. Maybe, maybe later this week, maybe after service is over, you say, you know what, I want to sit down and call. Maybe you come into the office on Monday and say, hey, I need to sit down. I need an appointment. I need to talk to somebody. We would love nothing more for that to be your signpost day. So whether it's right now in this moment or tomorrow or this week or next moment, I'm just telling you, the invitation is never, never ever closed. We are constantly willing and waiting, exciting to have that conversation. But do not wait too late. Let today be that signpost day. Let's pray together. Lord, Lord, sin has destroyed everything in my life that it has touched. It wants to rip away all that is living, all that is good, all that is pure. And Lord, if you let sin run wild, unrestrained, nothing would be left. But instead, you chose to send your son. And he became a powerful blessing. And for all who would choose to follow him, he's making all things new. He promises us hope that even though while we can't see it just yet, the harvest is coming. And our future is pure. So Lord, that's where we place our hope. That's where we place our trust. Lord, we are grateful. Lord, I pray that today would be a signpost day. Day that everything would look one way before this day and everything would look like something else ahead of it. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. If you'd like to have a conversation to talk about that decision or, or anything regarding your faith, I'm going to be right down front as we continue to worship. Let's stand and sing together. Tis so sweet. Just in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, and to know the Savior. the Lord, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him.
And some of y'all will get tired of looking at me. I don't know. Been up here quite a bit lately. Uh, my name is Stan Stack. I'm chairman of the elders this year. And every year, according to our church bylaws, we have to have a very brief church congregational meeting. So I'm going to ask our ushers and our deacons who are at the back to start passing out ballots. If you're a member of this church, please take one and complete it. And as you leave today, hand it to the ushers as you leave. Uh, they will appreciate it greatly if you don't fold it ten times. Just hand it to them or fold it once. Uh, last year I got a few folded as footballs and one person decided to do origami. So please keep it simple for us, okay? Uh, on this ballot you're going to see the names of our uh, people who are returning as elders and deacons and also those who are new. So look closely at those names and if you uh, would vote accordingly and if you don't know somebody it's okay not to vote um, for that name, that's okay. Uh, but I'm going to ask them to stand if they're in the auditorium today so that you can lay eyes on them. Uh, Stephen Clem and Chris Lee. I you know Chris is, uh, let's see, there's Chris walking over here handing them out, okay? And uh, Stephen's usually in second service. Uh, for Deacon, Steve Jackson, who's also passing out things today. He's standing back here in the sweater vest, if you don't know Steve. Daryl McCarty is running our camera right here in the middle in the blue jacket. Justin McElfresh. David Schumann, and David Smith. And David's here also. Yep, he's standing right down here. And then we also vote for our church clerk and our treasurer, uh, Mike Mears, church clerk for the coming year. and He's church clerk this year. And uh, same for our treasurer, Larry Hitchner. He's treasurer this year and uh, been nominated uh, by the elders for treasurer next year. And finally, our church budget, which we uh, talked about, we had a discussion about just a couple weeks ago, and it was distributed, and there was copies of a budget guide out in the lobby for the last couple weeks. We also had two meetings. The last one was on Wednesday morning here at the church for anyone that had questions about the bus budget. So hopefully, if you had questions, you were able to attend one of those. So as you leave today, uh, hand those to the gentleman who will be standing by the door. I want to bring up a couple of things before we close today. First, our anniversary Sunday is November 5th, and that's a big deal for us. One of the things that's happened for this November 5th is we have invited the community to come see what's happened here and what's going on here. So thousands of invitations are going out to the community. We expect a, a nice presence here that morning, but it's also an opportunity for you to welcome people who are new to Tate's Creek or coming to see what's going on here. So be sure to be part of that. Uh, also on that Sunday, November 5th, we're going to have an anniversary offering, which we have not had in a few years. Uh, we try to take care of issues so that we don't uh, belabor you with them, but our HVAC system for the second level that covers the classrooms and the offices has been failing all summer long. Most days I come in here, it's not working, and they're sitting in the heat back there. Uh, it's a challenge. We've got money to, most of the money needed, but we need more to finish that up. So that'll be a goal, and we'll be announcing that goal soon, but that's over and above our normal giving. But one of the things that I want to pray for this morning uh, very earnestly, there's two things, actually. First of all, for the literal family, uh, Melvin and Sue sit right down front here about every Sunday, and Melvin passed away early this morning. And Justin's been with that family this morning. And uh, we want to play for Sue and the family. That's, that's a horrible loss for our church. They were, they're fixtures here. And then something that's probably or should be on the mind of everybody in here is this horrible attack on God's chosen people yesterday. The forces of evil exist in our world, and they attacked Israel yesterday. Over 3,000 missiles filed, fired in just a very short period of time. Most of the images can't be shown on the news, but I saw some of them last night where they just stopped traffic on the interstates and killed people in their cars as they walked down the roads. That's how vicious the attack was. Women, children, it didn't matter. Horrible, horrible thing. So as we close today, I want to close prayerfully and uh, consider the things that we have, this, these burdens that we need to uh, lift up to our Lord. If you'll be with me in prayer, then we'll, we'll be dismissed. Our Father God in heaven, we come to you this morning. Uh, we want to lift up Sue and the literal family. This is just a it's got to be devastating for them, but only the peace that you provide can ever, uh, can ever be sufficient for them. Certainly, they, they have a certain amount of peace right now knowing that Melvin's uh, life was dedicated to Christ and they share that hope. 
the hope that we all share. But we ask for your comforting hand on them and help us to be a comfort to them and be the family, the Christian family that we can be to be a comfort to them in their loss. Father God, we have a, a big event coming up and we ask that you bless our anniversary day and it's, it's going to truly be special and it's a, a milestone for our church and we ask that you help us to be a, a light to this community, especially on that day. Father, heavy on our hearts this morning is the terrible, horrible assault on your people. It seems like their entire history, Lord, has been made up of being subjugated, being herded off into captivity, attempts to wipe them from the face of the earth. Even in the last day, there was countries calling, a country calling for Israel to be wiped from the earth. That tells us the threat is always there. Help us as children of Abraham to be ones who will go forth and show our support for a country that truly needs to have a lasting peace and a home of their own on this earth. We ask your special comfort on them, their blessing. We ask your blessing on the, on the men and women who are defending that country this morning and putting their lives on the line to protect the civilians. So many lost their lives yesterday. Please be with them. They need it desperately this morning. Thank you for your abundant grace and mercy. And most of all, this morning, we, we pray for your peace. In Christ Jesus' name we pray.